welcome to the VMware Cloud on AWS Technical Overview session. This is a follow-up session of a previous podcast called Introduction to VMware Cloud on AWS. My name is Elena Kristeva. I'm a solution engineer with the VMware Cloud on AWS team. I'm based in the UK and my role is to work with customers and help them understand and adopt VMware Cloud on AWS service. This session is a technical look at several aspects of VMware Cloud on AWS. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask these in the Q&A um, box below. And myself and another colleague will answer these as we go through the session. So today we're going to um, go over a few things. So although this is part two of webinar series, we're going to start with a quick uh, recap of VMware Cloud on AWS. So what the product is, how it addresses some common challenges that our customers are facing when looking to move to the public cloud. Then we will cover um, in a little more detail the VMware Cloud on AWS SDVC, um, things like hosts and clusters, and specific features related to, to that product. We're going to then have a brief look at networking, um, so configuration options and connectivity, and focus on workload migration. So basically answer the question of how can I move my workload to VMware Cloud on AWS. And then we're going to finish with a little recap of um, VMware Cloud on AWS again, so what, what we discussed through this um, session, and share some useful resources. So let's get started. We are headed to a multi-cloud world. When speaking to customers, um, they have a very clear cloud strategy um, in mind. And the preferred approach actually is hybrid cloud. So unlike the binary decision that we had before, uh, where customers had to choose of whether to keep their workload on, on premises or migrate them to the public cloud, we can now seamlessly do both. And so we hear about common issues and challenges our customers face when, when looking to migrate to the public cloud. And the first one being with operational consistency. So generally, by running workloads on premises and then running those in the cloud, we are op uh, there are operational consistencies that occur because of um, other different platforms. And so what do we mean by that? So different cloud environments require different skill sets, different management and monitoring tools. Um, customers would have to consider different controls and security methods. And so in a lot of cases, there will be the need to change internal operating process, maybe even change team structure. So furthermore, traditional enterprise applications are typically stateful applications. So they run on resilient infrastructure and leverage things like um, VMware HA, DRS, and, and more. However, in the public cloud, you get very different experience. So it's a different set of SLAs. You must rebuild or refactor your applications to become um, stateless or to incorporate resiliency within those within the application itself. And so this could be a very um, long and very expensive process. But we can use the public cloud today and communicate to our on-premises environment, and this is correct. However, some capability, um, or some compatibility issues may arise from that. So those could be issues with um, privacy and data sovereignty, issues um, with latency sensitive applications, for example. And so all these challenges make it very difficult for customers to basically adopt that multi-cloud strategy. And how do we address this with VMware? Well, we give you the best of both worlds. Operational consistency, with your existing workloads, so it's the same look and feel as your own data center, with the flexibility of the public cloud and the ability to take advantage of AWS native services. 
So there's no need to refactor or rebuild applications in order to bring them to the public cloud. And so we're able to do this by having two powerhouses coming together. So um, VMware, uh, the leaders in, in, public, in private cloud, and of course Amazon Web Services, they are the industry leader in public cloud. Through our partnership and joint engineering with AWS, we've created an environment that is integrated with and runs on AWS global infrastructure, and all of this is using the VMware software stack. So let's have a closer look. On the left-hand side, you can see your um, effectively your on-premises data center, where you're in charge of infrastructure, operations, power, cooling, management, and so on. In the middle here, we have VMware Cloud and AWS. Now, as we said, this is a jointly engineered solution between VMware and AWS, and it brings VMware's enterprise class software defined data center, or an SDDC, to the public cloud. It's a combination of vSphere, vSAN, and NSX, along with a dedicated vCenter server. So it's all deployed on bare metal Amazon infrastructure. There's no nested virtualization going on, no dependency on Amazon machine images and, and so on. So these bare metal instances are fairly sizable hosts, and we're going to have a closer look um, at these a little later in the webinar. And so we package these up and deliver them as a service. So it's all sold, delivered, and supported by VMware. We then give you the option to connect that SDDC back to your on-premises environment. So if we look at that gray ribbon here um, around the two vCenter instances, this is effectively a feature, it signifies a feature called um, hybrid linked mode. So this is something that allows you to link the two environments together and to get that single pane of glass view of your two environments. So you can manage and view and manage both from one interface, one window. Another one of our key design principles from day one is to make um, is to not make customers go out and find new tools or new management packs uh, and so on. And so we want customers to be able to leverage the tools and capabilities they already have. And so maybe you're already using something um, like vRealize Automation or another automation tool or vRealize Operations or another operations tool. Or maybe you're using Power CLI script. So all of these should just work with VMware Cloud on AWS. That's, what we, that's why we give you direct access to the um, vCenter API. So for us, that's just another endpoint talking to all of these tools out there. And the last piece of the puzzle, and the one I think is very important um, to customers and absolutely a key differentiator for VMware Cloud on AWS, is the integration with AWS native services. So we have this unique high-speed, um, low-latency connection between our BMC SDDC and Amazon native services through something called an ENI. And you can think about that as a dedicated network connection from your VMC environment into native AWS environment. And so that's a key differentiator here. It gives our customers direct access to native cloud services and allows them to leverage those to create some, some very interesting architectures. So by partnering with AWS, we are also able to leverage their um, growing global footprint. So we are available today in several um, AWS regions across the world. And the goal is for VMware Cloud and AWS to be available in every AWS region across the globe. Now, for those customers that are looking to adopt this hybrid cloud approach, um, we, we kind of see and come across these three main use cases. 
So the first one being when uh, where our customers are looking to maintain and expand their data center footprint. And so this may be because they're looking um, uh, to add additional um, ge geographical locations. So they need to expand um, in additional geolocations. They're looking out to um, onboard recent, recent merchants and acquisitions maybe. Or they're just simply running out of space or resource on premises. So we have customers who are looking to modernize and or consolidate um, from multiple data center locations. Or maybe there's a need to migrate specific workloads and applications to the cloud in order to take advantage of those um, cloud, those native cloud platform services in order to bring innovation and derive business value of core applications. Disaster recovery is probably also worth a mention here because we do have customers looking into VMC for a new DR location or maybe somewhere to complement their existing DR strategy. Or maybe there's just need for burst capacity for seasonal workloads, maybe test and dev environments. So now that we've covered all this, um, let's have a look at the cloud software defined data center inside VMware Cloud on AWS. So basically, when you spin up an SDDC, what do you get? And so what we give you here is a very scalable um, service, a very, very scalable environment. Each software-defined data center can have up to 20 vSphere clusters, all managed by the same vCenter. Each cluster can scale up to 16 hosts. Which gives you around, which gives you 320 hosts per vCenter server. All of this will reside with your, within your own um, VMware account. So if you need to add more, you can have up to 10 of those STDCs within that same account or the same logical grouping that we call an organization. And so this makes things very easy to administer. Where might you need to um, you know, consider these deployment options? It could be purely for scale, or maybe there are certain workloads that you want to run separately, like um, separating production workloads from pre-prod environments or having a dedicated database cluster, for example. As I mentioned earlier, your VMware Cloud and AWS environment is managed and supported by VMware. So we take care of managing, upgrading, patching, all the hosts and all the management components of your SDDC. And so to ensure that all environments behave correctly, um, VMware manages the systems exclusively. So there are some restrictions compared to an on-prem SDDC, like um, no direct access to management VMs, um, which would be um, things like your vCenter server, NSX manager, et cetera, or no host root-based access. Now, you can log into your vCenter, and you can use it to operate and manage the environment. In fact, that's what you use to operate and manage the environment. But you can't really apply any changes or shut down the vCenter appliance itself. So the only cluster within that SDDC that contains um, those management workloads is, is cluster one. Every additional one is fully available for customer workload. So basically anything highlighted in blue here is managed by VMware and anything in green is managed by you, by the customer. And so by not giving, but not having to deal with this um, host-based operations, you can focus on what really matters. And that's your workloads and applications. The cluster here becomes just the building block. This is the view of the environment from the VMware Cloud and AWS console. There are two software-defined data centers here running in my account. Each tile here represents an SDDC. So I can click on either one of them and go into a little more detail. Inside here, I can see the combined resource in my first SDDC. 
It contains two clusters, each of which have three different hosts, which is, by the way, the minimum production cluster size. And the view in the, sum in the summary tab here offers a very simple way to perform actions like um, adding or removing hosts or clusters from your SDDC. So what do I do if I, if I need to add a host? Well, it's a very simple task. I can do that manually, just click of a button, so the add host button here, at which point I can specify the number of hosts I want to add to my cluster or remove from the cluster. That process of adding a host takes about 10 minutes, and so unlike an on-prem environment, you don't have to worry about um, over or under provisioning, or maybe um, w worry about project delays that could be caused by multi-month long host acquisition process and then um, the, the additional tasks of um, racking, stacking, configuring that infrastructure and so on. I can add hosts manually or I can let the system manage that for me. And so here's how. We can do this through something called um, Elastic DRS. And Elastic DRS is able to automatically scale resources up or down based on workload demand. So to facilitate that growth or shrinking of the cluster, um, customer can set up minimum and maximum threshold of resources. So when the infrastructure utilization um, goes over those thresholds or reaches those, those thresholds, then a new, cluster, a new host will be automatically added to the cluster. And when operations return back to normal within those uh, target thresholds, everything's fine, behaving as expected, then we would be able to remove uh, uh, from the cluster dynamically. And so there are a couple of options for EDRS here. So we can optimize that for best performance. Um, and so, which basically means that EDRS is less eager to remove a host, meaning it's going to have more leeway to give your virtual machines um, the performance that they require. Or we can optimize it for lower cost. So when optimizing for, for lower cost, then more emphasis is placed on removing a host, a host as soon as possible um, in, in order to save, to save us money. So you can also set minimum and maxim, maximum cl cluster size, um, and Elastic DRS will always add a new host when, when storage utilization becomes critical. So VMware Cloud on AWS has a, a couple of host options right now. We started with um, bare metal hosts from Amazon's i3 family. And each of these has two Intel CPUs, 18 cores per socket, giving us about 36 cores per host and half terabyte of memory. So if we use the, the three node cluster example from earlier, we um, are looking at about 108 cores and one and a half terabytes of RAM. Each i3 metal host has about N, uh, eight NVMe drives. Uh, these devices are distributed across two vSAN disk groups, and within those, one NVMe device is used for write caching tier, and the other three are used for storage capacity tier. Very much like uh, uh, vSAN works on-prem. And so giving us about 10 terabytes of raw capacity per host. The data stores in your SDDC are assigned the default VM storage policy by default, thus workloads are always protected. And so customers can choose to configure their own storage policies to provide the appropriate protection level against um, host or, or component, component failures. And depending on the number of the, on the number of hosts in the cluster, those could be um, RAID one, five, or six, and uh, uh, and can be used for for um, fault tolerance. 
By default, VSAN encryption, deduplication and compression are enabled and cannot be turned off. So each i3 dot metal host has eight NVMe drives. Uh, these devices are distribu distributed across two vSAN disk groups. And with those, um, one NVMe device is used for the bright caching tier, and the other three are used for um, the storage capacity tier, giving us about 10 terabytes of raw capacity per host. The data stores in your, v uh, in your SDDC are assigned the default VM storage policy well, by default. Thus, workloads are always protected. And so customers can configure their own storage policies um, to, to uh, provide the appropriate protection um, against host or component failure. And depending on the number of hosts in the cluster, uh, there are different um, fault tolerance policies here. Um, you can choose from RAID 1, 5, or 6. And of course, like vSAN encryption, deduplication, and compression are available by default. So the i3.metal host uh, is delivering, you know, great performance and, you know, great for almost for any virtualized workload. We recently made available a new instance from Amazon's R5 family, and so these are a little different. Um, than the i3 hosts because they're effectively diskless hosts. And in terms of compute, they offer a slightly high compute resource. So again, dual socket, Intel CPUs. And that delivers us a total of 48 cores per, per host and 768 gig of memory. And if we use the three node cluster example again, then we're looking at uh, about 144 cores and just over two terabytes of memory. Now, the new R5 hosts will have different storage layout um, in that they're taking advantage of Amazon Elastic Block Storage. So specifically, we're using the Amazon uh, General Purpose SDVCs or, or GP2 volume. And split these into um, three disk groups. So each host can be configured with 15 to 35 terabyte, uh, terabytes of storage. And this is configured during the cluster deployment process and applies to all hosts within the same cluster. So storage policies can be applied in the exact same way as usual. And deduplication here is disabled, but you still get. Um, uh, the benefits of compression and encryption, which are enabled by default. And so these instances are great for uh, capacity optimized workloads and um, potentially deliver faster host remediation time in, in case of, of host failure, because again, we're using EBS volumes instead of internal drives. And so you can attach and detach those to hosts uh, uh, quicker. As I said earlier, like vSAN encryption is enabled by default, um, it, and it's on each cluster that is deployed in your SDDC. That can't be turned off. And this is an important feature. So something that we made available for customers who are required to periodically perform rekey operations for compliance reasons. And so to enable this core use case, we integrated vSAN encryption into VMC. So while on-premises vSAN can use any um, compliant key management service, with VMC on AWS, we utilize the um, Amazon KMS service. Certain mission-critical applications are licensed per core. So um, we've introduced the ability to turn off CPU cores within a VMC cluster. And customers would have the option to specify the number of cores per host um, across that entire cluster and thus reduce the cost of running some of those mission-critical workloads. It just offers additional compute flexibility here. And so we, we now know what our environment could look like. Um, so what do we do to protect workloads in VMC? So although all, all of our hosts 
um, are built with redundant components, um, failures may occur. And as we said, this is delivered as a service. So we look after the environment, and once again, we take advantage of the cloud and VMC feature called automated cluster remediation. That means that if we detect an issue with a host or a host failure, we'll go ahead and add an additional host to the cluster, configure it, and start the process of rebuilding or, or migrating data. And once that is complete, the affected host will be removed from the cluster, and there's nothing for you to worry about. So the benefit here is that we don't have to plan for additional host capacity uh, for, for high availability or to avoid long-term resource depletion in case of a failure. For those very critical workloads, we also have the um, capability to use a stretch cluster feature. Now, an SDDC is deployed in an AWS availability zone. With the stretch cluster feature, we can deploy an SDDC, which spans two availability zones. So this basically evenly distributes your workloads and hosts across, across two different AZs, and a witness node is placed in a third availability zone. So most regions have three availability zones. Um, some of them have more. And again, like any other um, cloud service, um, we'd always recommend that customers check availability of, of those services or products within um, the desired region. And so we'd basically automatically extend workload logical networks, and we use um, a vSAN stretch cluster feature, so you effectively get that synchronous replication between the two AZs. And in the unlikely event of an availability zone um, failure, then vSphere HA, we attempt to restart workloads on the surviving site, and therefore giving customers this high availability and zero RPO um, for, for those critical workloads. All VMware networking in VMware Cloud on AWS is provided by NSX. And so we previously saw that um, from compute perspective, we had two different portions of the SDDC carved up which um, ha were the management resource pool and data store, where all the SDDC management components reside. And then we have the compute data store and resource pool of uh, customer workloads. So very similarly, in order to provide connectivity to VMC, uh, we, we have two, you know, two gateways are created. So there's the management edge gateway that allows the customer to connect to management components of the SDDC, like um, vCenter, for example. And then we have the compute gateway, which is also um, uh, uh, which, which is also on NSX Edge and allows for ingress and, and egress VM network traffic from um, the customer workloads. And so, you can think about these as effectively um, routes to which logical networks are attached. And you can control and modify access and firewall policies uh, uh, for your workloads here. And so we try, this, we try to make it a very, very simple and easy process for customers to administer and perform those sort of day-to-day -day operations. And so if we look at features um, that NSX provides, like um, connectivity, so IPsec, VPN, or, or Direct Connect, which is a high bandwidth low latency direct connection to AWS uh, regions, which is provided by Amazon. Or uh, there are security features like uh, firewalling and, and micro-segmentation. And um, micro-segmentation basically uh, is a feature of NSX that allows you to have more granular control over east-west traffic between workloads. So all of these and more are available with VMware Cloud on AWS. 
And so all of this is administered from this network and security tab here in the um, BMC console. And this is where you'd go to set up your VPN connection, create networks or segments, um, as we call them. And so let's now go and have a look of how you uh, might go about creating a network to then attach your, your VM to. So VMware Cloud on AWS administrators can decide on uh, which subnet the compute VM will be located. And so you can, you can use the, the Cloud Console or APIs for that matter uh, to create network segments, also um, sometimes referred to you know, logical networks. And basically you do that by going to network and security segments, um, Sorry, network and security network segment to create a, a new network segment in, and connect your VM to. Then you can give your network a name. Um, you have the option to enable DHCP uh, on each network segment if you want to. And so the network type could either be rooted or extended. And so a rooted network um, will print, principally be the default type. So these networks um, use the SDDC uh, compute gateway as a default gateway, and um, rooted networks have connectivity to other logical networks in the same SDDC or to external network services such as um, the SDDC firewall or, or NAT and, and so on. And so you can have up to, uh, you know, you can have a thousand VMs on each network segment. And so Connectivity, um, connecting your VMware Cloud and AWS environment to the outside world or to your on-premises environment is very, very simple. We've already kind of covered some of the options here, but basically you can connect your existing um, environment to or your existing on-prem environment to VMware Cloud um, on, on AWS via either Direct Connect or, with, um, or through the internet. with a traditional IPsec VPN. That could be rooted or policy-based VPN, and we have the ability to also stretch a network um, from your on-prem environment to VMC if, if that's what you require. And finally, we have the option to use HCX. Now, HCX is a, an add-on service to VMC. Um, it comes with a package, and it's free of charge. So it's basically a tool that is used for work workloads uh, mobility and large-scale application migrations, but more on that in a few minutes. And so now that I've, I've got my SDDC and connected it, how do I get workloads uh, into my VMware Cloud on AWS environment? There are a couple of options. Um, And the first one being very simple, um, which is effectively um, sharing content using the content library. Um, this is a good way to share OVAs, templates, maybe ISO images, and so on between your on-prem environment and the MC. So we briefly mentioned hybrid linked modes um, at the beginning of this webcast. And this is basically a feature that allows customers to link their VMware Cloud on AWS vCenter server instance on-prem uh, and their vCenter uh, and their STDC environment in VMC. And so that gives you the ability to view and manage um, the inventories of both your on-premises and VMware Cloud and AWS data centers, and all from a single vSphere client interface. It's very similar to enhanced link mode, which is a um, feature that we, we've had available on-premises for, for quite some time. And so one key important difference here is that unlike enhanced link mode, we don't require uh, the two vCenter servers to be on the exact same version. So with hybrid linked mode, it's possible to migrate VMs 
uh, from your on-prem environment to your VMware Cloud on AWS SDVC. And that's both um, cold migration or migration of powered off VMs or even live vMotion. motion. So of course note that there will be some prerequisites here of bandwidth um, a requirement and so on. Now, what if I need to migrate a, a larger environment, right? Um, so maybe the data center or, or application migration scenario from earlier. Well, if we're looking to do a light scale migration um, from on-prem to the cloud with VMware Cloud and AWS, this is very, very simple. So maybe you're looking to uh, close down a data center or, or just, again, move select applications to the cloud. And as part of the service, you get VMware HCX. And what they do, what the, that does is um, enable you to um, easily and efficiently migrate or lift and shift workloads from your on-prem environment to your new VMware Cloud on AWS environment. And ATX provides a um, very secure and seamless workload portability from both on-prem uh, to VMC and back. And so, ATX supports live vMotion migration as well as bulk migration, with, which is effectively migration with very low, uh, low downtime. It abstracts and removes the boundaries of underlying infrastructure, and so you can focus on your workloads. So your on-premises environment can be any vSphere version from vSphere 5 and above. And of course, your cloud environment can be the latest software-defined SDVC. And so you're not constrained by older vSphere versions or having to go through um, an upgrade task before you can, you can migrate your workloads. So in order to start migration, we, we first need network in place between the source and destination side. And, and ATX does that itself. Um, it does uh, also combine WAN optimization, deduplication, compression, so to increase um, efficiency while also decreasing time it takes to perform those migrations. And so with the bulk migration option, you can move many virtual machines in parallel and even schedule that migration. Because this is a warm migration um, and there is a short downtime, you can start the migration process and schedule that to be completed at a time which, which works for you. So now let's have a look at a live vMotion. So in this example, we're going to move a virtual machine live from our data center in Houston, Texas, to our um, VMware Cloud on AWS um, environment in um, US East region. Now let's have a look at a live vMotion. In this example, I'm going to move a virtual machine from our on-premises um, data center in Houston to our VMware Cloud on AWS environment in the in US um, East region. So to do that, all I need to do is log into my HCX environment, go to the Migration tab, Migrate a Virtual Machine, then that will pull up the Virtual Machine inventory from my source side or my on-premise DDC in this case. I then choose what Virtual Machine I'd like to migrate, set all the required parameters like um, destination folder, resource pool, data store, and so on. I'm going to choose vMotion as my migration method. Select the network. In this case, the extended network I have from, from my on-prem environment. Click Next. So HCX will go and do some validation checks 
if these are successful, we then proceed with the migration. And so we're just now in the process of, of migrating a virtual machine across um, about 2,000 kilometer distance. And all of that is done in about four minutes. So the video is sped up for the purposes of the webinar, but the task took around about four minutes. And this is how simple workload migration to the cloud can be. So customers usually ask about account structure and data charges. So here is a quick overview of what data charges look like. As with any other public cloud, data going into the cloud is free of charge and data egress is chargeable. So depending on how you connect to VMware Cloud and AWS, whether it's over the internet or through um, Direct Connect, there are different egress charges that apply. And so a five cent or, or, or two cents per gigabyte respectively. Data traffic going over the ENI from VMC to the connected um, Amazon VPC within the same availability zone is free of charge. So this gives you the option to um, access AWS native services residing in there without having to worry about um, data traffic charges and so on. And so basically here, anything in blue on this slide is paid by VMware and charged back to the customer. And so there's, there's no markup on the prices or anything like that. Um, and anything in green is uh, paid by the customer directly to AWS. So now um, we've only got a few minutes left, so so let's have a quick look at um, VMware Cloud on on AWS API platform. So a couple of options um, here, and so we mentioned APIs a few times and. We effectively have three API services here, uh, which can be used to interact with, with VMware services. So the first one, um, console.cloud.vmware.com is effectively um, primarily for authentication against our uh, cloud services platform. Then once you've got uh, an authentication token, you can work with uh, vmc.vmware.com, which uh, effectively allows you to, to do such thing as deploy, um, a program, uh, deploy your STDCs, add clusters, um, add and remove hosts, configure networks, and, and so on. And all of those neg regular uh, administrative, administrative activities. The vCenter server API here, um, API service, is all of the regular vCenter APIs that, that you would be um, working with in your own on-prem environment as well. And so let's have a quick recap. Um, VMware Cloud on AWS here, you know, is, is a cloud service, so it's delivered as a service. It's fully configured VMware Cloud software stack, which is provisioned, operated, um, and managed directly by VMware. And so you've got um, your um, automated uh, account creation and automated uh, interconnect creation between uh, VMware um, SDDC and AWS um, services and that are running within your um, own VPC in your own AWS customer account. Everything, um, so support is provided by VMware directly. Um, it's a very, very simple um, way to, to access support. So um, typically done through a chat window, and then you go through to our uh, global um, customer services support. And a lot of, a lot of the cases um, are, are solved, in fact, a large proportion of the cases, over 80% or so right then and there within that chat. So um, again, it's a very different experience from what you may be used to on-prem of you know, logging a support call, waiting a certain amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we do those day-to-day -day operations as well. So the ongoing infrastructure monitoring, infrastructure upgrades, refresh, um, so the, the, the whole sort of software stack maintenance. So 
anything that you need to worry about is just place your workloads in there uh, and, and look after those. So how can I get started? Um, a great way to start is to try a hands-on lab. Um, so here's a link to our VMware Cloud on AWS Getting Started hands-on lab. It's going to be available later on in the handout section as well. Here are some additional useful resources. Um, so the, the few useful links here to uh, frequently asked questions, um, pricing, sizing, and so on. Um, another interesting thing that we do that's a little bit different um, for VMware is that our roadmap is publicly available. So you can go online and have a look at what we're working on, which features are already available, um, and, and what are the, the next cool features that we're looking to bring out to customers. And of course, we have our um, uh, support and terms of services available online as well. So thank you very much for your time today. I hope you found this webinar useful. And um, if you would like to, if you found this topic interesting and you'd like to get in touch, uh, please reach out to, to your VMware representative and I would hope to hear from you soon.